Um, so I must say, it's a fraction daunting speaking in front of so many speakers of so much caliber. Uh, I think I should consider it an honor. So PSLQ, we've heard mentioned many times during this talk. John spoke about it, Mark spoke about it, David spoke about it. Um, I'm very pleased to say no one's actually covered anything which I was planning on covering. So my plan today is I'm going to actually talk a little bit more about the actual specifics of the PSQ algorithm and talk about my attempts to extend it uh, out to further fields. So, starting to start, if we've got a real vector, we say an integer relation of that vector is just a vector of integers such that the linear combination is equal to zero. So the, the integer relation is the the integer coefficients of the linear combination. Um, so that's very specific to reals and integers. We can actually extend this definition out to where we have a vector, a complex vector, in which case our integer relation is actually a relation of Gaussian integers. Uh, so I trust everyone knows what a Gaussian integer is. Uh, and even as far as an n-dimensional uh, Hilbert vector, in which case we get uh, now, there's been some consternation for what these things are called. I'm reliably informed they're Lipschitz quaternions. Whatever the heck you call a quaternion with integer coefficients. <laughs> so I've seen Lipschitz quaternions, I've seen Lipschitz integers, I've seen Hamiltonian integers. We know what we're talking about. We can extend this idea out, and PSLQ is actually known to work in every single one of these cases. Now, in practice, usually we look at the real or the complex cases. So, this is a point of notation, since PSLQ can actually work over several fields, etc., etc. For the moment, I'm going to denote my blackboard bold F the field of the input vector and by math calligraphic O as the um, integer ring of the output. Okay, so more technically, now if you read Bailey's, uh, Bailey, Ferguson, and Arno's paper from 96, 97. Somewhere around that vicinity. Tip, tip, tip. Ferguson is the first author. Ferguson? Let's, okay. Let's, let's get the facts. Okay, fair enough. Ferguson, Bailey, and Arno, right? Uh, they'll, they'll talk about PSLQ tau. Tau is a parameter which may be freely chosen. So, in order to understand this, we need to know about these three interrelated parameters tau, rho, and gap. They have this relationship here, this inverse, uh, inverse square relationship. And rho is the one that's fixed. So, so long as we've actually fixed our input field and our output uh, integer ring, we can set rho to be 1 on epsilon, where epsilon is some bound of the distance between an element of the field and its nearest integer. And uh, you may have missed it if we pop back to the regular slide. I'm denoting by mint the nearest integer. Uh, so my nearest integer will be, it's actually a family of functions. I'm trusting the context will make it clear which one I'm in. So if we can bound the distance between an element of the field and its nearest integer, then we can set rho to be the inverse of that bound. And rho set, we can freely pick tau to be between 1 and rho, and gamma remains uniquely determined. Uh, so that's the principle. I should point out, these parameters mostly were used in proofs of uh, um, bounded run times. They don't crop up so much in the description of the algorithm, although we will look at gamma again. That's a theory. Uh, in practice, when the thing works, practice what we actually tend to do is we don't worry about tau so much. We find the gamma which makes tau equal to 1 in the previous relationship and just freely pick any gamma greater than that. And so there's three standard cases which the literature all just states explicitly. In our real case, rho is 2, so our gamma is 2 on root 3. Uh, in the complex case, we have rho as being 2, which gives us a root 2, which gives us a gamma of greater than root 2. And in the quaternionic case, we have rho equals 1, which uh, insists on, which necessitates gamma being infinity. I'm not actually sure how that works in practice, um, but that's what the paper, paper puts forward. Uh, I'm not going to consider the quaternions. I'm really interested in the real and complex cases anyway, in which case we could. So that's, that's the preliminaries. Okay, so, how it works. Uh, I recommend these papers for the details. Um, in particular, if you're new to PSLQ, the bottom one by Stroud is a particularly useful starting point. Well, we're aware of that. But... Hmm. It's not really a paper so much as an article he wrote. It's a couple of pages long, but it's, it's a good, it's a very good start. Um, so, 
How it works very, very basically is as far as follows. Uh, I should probably hasten before I get too much into this to point out, this isn't the way you'd actually implement this in a computer system. This is a description of the implementation which explains how it works. The computer implementation uses a lot of uh, optimizations. If you were to implement what I've got here just naively, you'd actually get a very poor performing algorithm. Uh, but for the sake of explaining how my extensions work, I want the simple version. So okay, if we take an input, uh, an n-dimensional vector in our input field, first thing we do is we initialize a matrix with call H to be the n by n minus 1 lower trapezoidal. Uh, if you don't know about lower trapezoidal, just think lower triangular. It's just a, if you generalize the idea of lower triangular to a non-square matrix, you get lower trapezoidal. And if you draw a couple of pictures, you'll see why. So in the following lower trapezoidal matrix defined by these terms, where the S sub i's are a term defined by this relation. These are our partial squares and sums. Uh, I believe Dave mentioned it. I, David, I apologise. I forgot to. PSLQ is so named because it uses partial squares and an, or partial squares of sums in an LQ matrix decomposition. So that's the PS right there. Um, and just for reference, completely useless, but this is what they look like in the case of n equal two, three, and four. Rather ugly, they work. So next, we perform the so-called Hermite reduction. Uh, so this is going to be important later. Uh, this is going to be important later on for my extensions. But Hermite reduction is defined for a lower trapezoidal matrix, and we actually construct an integer invertible matrix where the inverse has integer entries as well, GLN, uh, GLNO, using this recursive formula. And then we initialize our matrices D to be just this first Hermite reduction matrix of H. We set A to be D, B to be D inverse. <coughs> then we replace X with X D inverse and H with D H. And we finish initialization. So just for reference, again, good. So uh, these get big quickly, but this, this is the case of the reducing matrix uh, in the case of N equals 2 and N equals 3. Now, I want to point out that when I first looked at this, it was in no way obvious to me why it was these were inverse. Um, the key points turn out to be that these are integer, integer matrices. We have invertible, integer, inter, invertible integer entries pardon me, down in the diagonal and integer entries below that. It's lower trapezoidal. It turns out you can make a, um, an elementary matrix argument which will show that if you have any the matrix with elements in any ring, if the diagonals are invertible elements in that <coughs> ring and it's lower trapezoidal, it's guaranteed to be invertible and the inverse will be in the same, the inverse will have elements in the same ring. Again, this is going to be very useful later on. So these are uh, definitely elements of GLN, uh, uh, GLNO, yes. And then finally, the basic algorithm is we repeat until our XJ uh, vector has a zero in it for some element, for some entry. We choose, this is where our gamma comes into play. We look at the diagonal entries of the H matrix. We raise the first diagonal entry to gamma to the power one, the second diagonal entry to gamma to the power two, sorry, multiply the second entry by gamma to the power two. Read what's on the board, that's what's coming out of my mouth, I'm sorry. Et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the second last one. And we pick which of those is greater than all the others. And then we swap uh, either the rows or the columns as appropriate in the various matrices, that element we found, and the next one. So we pick an element, swap it with the next one. Uh, if we're swapping X, we're just swapping the R and R plus one element. We swap the columns in H and A and the rows in B. Now it's possible H may not be lower trapezoidal. Uh, in which case we have to compute a unary matrix Q. I'm not going to give the details of this matrix because it's very technical, very messy, and isn't actually needed for what I'm doing. Uh, the details are in the Ferguson paper. But we compute it and uh, replace H with HQ, and I think I've left out a step. I think we actually have to replace um, A, A and D with a multiple of Q here as well. But the point is that you know, 
This may not be uh, lower trapezoidal anymore, so we need to fix it so that it is. I'm pretty sure this part is somehow equivalent to LQ decomposition, so I'm pretty sure that this step right here is the LQ in PSLQ. But it's, it's fixing up a possible mess from the swapping. And then we just do the uh, Hermite reduction again, computing a new D, and uh, replace X, H, A, and B with X, D, inverse, D, H, D, A, and B, D, inverse, rinse, repeat. And we go, we go looking for a zero in the X vector. So no, this X, this X vector is being updated. It's not going to be the original vector we put in. Uh, I think later implementations tend to make a copy of it for neatness sakes, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. Uh, if we find an xj equals zero, that tells us that the jth column of B is an integer relation. We stop, spit it out, and we're done. Uh, another interesting thing about PSLQ, which I'm just going to mention in passing, is that each iteration we don't find a relation, we have effectively computed a lower bound on the norm of any such relation there could be. So if we compute for a while, and for whatever reason have to stop before we found one, we, know, we still know something about, the, uh, about possible integer relations. Okay, so that's our standard PSLQ from a very bird's eye view. Um, a number of these points are going to come in useful later. Okay, so quick refresh on some algebraic number theory for anyone who hasn't seen it before. If we have a complex number, we say that it's algebraic over Q if it's the zero of some polynomial with elements in Q. It's fairly standard. Uh, an algebraic extension field is just uh, a, it's a, of Q. It's just a field for which Q is a subfield for which every element of the, the extension field K is algebraic in Q. And in a particular case, it's a notation I'll be using repeatedly. If we have an algebraic number, we can actually talk about this notation here. I, I read that as Q adjoin A, a Q adjoin alpha. So I'll often talk about alpha as being the adjoint. I haven't used that terminology in any of the slides, but I'll probably say it without thinking at some stage. And it's just the space of all polynomials in alpha. Mm -hmm. um, if alpha was, a, was an indeterminate, we just have the regular space of, pol of polynomials. And if we have a finite number of algebraic numbers, then we... Yes. Don't we mean the set of all roots of polynomials P? No, I don't believe so. I believe this is actually the polynomials evaluated at alpha, Q adjoin alpha. Oh, 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 I see what you're doing. Oh. Um, yeah, so in the same sense that R adjoin... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and if we've got several of them, we can just essentially apply them iter iteratively and get a larger one. Uh, it's, it's easy enough, it's, there's a lemma in some algebraic number notes I was reading from Milne, I think, which states that if you've got a, a finite number of these affixes, then this Q adjoin alpha is exactly the same as the field of fractions for people who know about such things. So I'm just going to be using square bracket notation. Uh, so these, these things here are always algebraic extensions of Q, and they're essentially the, the kind I'm going to be looking at. Okay, so if our algebraic integers are defined as the collection of all numbers which are the zero of some monic polynomial with coefficients in Q. Oh no, sorry, with coefficients in the integers. And then if we have an algebraic extension field, we can talk about its ring of integers as just being the intersection of the collection of all algebraic integers with the field in question. Uh, so in particular, um, the integer, oh, it's not immediately clear from this definition that this is in fact a ring, but it is. Uh, it's not particularly necessary for what I'm doing, I don't think. But in particular, if we take the integers of the rationals, we get the regular integers we know, but we don't, if we take the integers of the reals, we don't. We get a much broader set. Um, root, root 2 is in this set, for example, as the root of x squared minus 2. Um, so that's all the algebraic number theory I'm covering. So now we can start talking about extending PSLQ. So I should probably point out, I'm reporting what we eventually decided on. There's been an awful lot of trial and error, mostly error, a lot of trial, <laughs> that's gone into what I'm showing you now. So I'm sort of giving you the cleaned up version, having swept, swept all the, all the long, uh, long and tedious stuff under the rug here. So, the eventual realization was, well, the brief that we received 
was to make PSLQ work in algebraic extension fields. Um, it took some, some cooing and hiring and we finally hit on the idea that, well, we're coming up with an integer relation. We've got algebraic extension fields that are algebraic integers, so it probably makes sense to come up with a relation that has algebraic integers. So that's what this definition here is giving us. So essentially, if we've got some field, an algebraic integer relation is just an integer relation where the elements of the integer, uh, where the elements of the integer vector are from an algebraic, in, uh, a ring of algebraic integers. It, it's the, pretty much the obvious extension. Uh, now, for the purpose of PSLQ, however, we need to actually specify now you know, what input field we're using, what algebraic uh, integer field we're using. So to this end, I've got this, I guess you'd call this a definition. So we've got some algebraic numbers. I'm going to define PSLQ subscript those algebraic numbers as just being the variant of the PSLQ that takes as an input a vector in the closure of Q adjoin these algebraics. And this is closure in the same sense that the closure of Q is the rationals. Uh, sorry, the closure of the rationals is the real. Yeah. Um, again, what's written on the board? <laughs> And we find an algebraic integer relation in the integer ring of that extension field Q adjoin the outputs. Um, so this necessarily, you know, it, it pairs our input. So if uh, if one of these alphas is comp is a complex integer, then our input vector is going to be complex numbers. If they're all real algebraics, then we have a real input. Um, this is quite nice because it generalizes to sorry it. it covers the already existing cases. If we think of the complex numbers as being the closure of Q adjoin root minus one, that fits exactly into this, uh, this framework and you've got to work a little bit harder to get the reals, but you know, think, of a, think of a trivial extension Q adjoin one, something like that. Yeah? What does the A signify in the superscript? Oh, the A, that's the, uh, the put note down there uh, ex explaining what the, uh, the, what, what the closure means, yeah. It's a little confusing, I apologize. So this is our basic idea for our extension. So we're going to basically pick, pick a rational extension field. We're going to take its closure as the input. We're going to take its integers as the integer relation output. So there's an awful lot of algebraic extension fields. So to, to keep ourselves sane to begin with, we're only going to consider quadratic extensions. In fact, we're only going to consider simple quadratic extensions of the form Q adjoin root D. Uh, we can assume without loss of generality that D is not congruent to zero mod four, because if it is, we can just factor the powers of four out, we've got one of the other three cases. We could probably even assume without loss of generality that D is square three, but it doesn't seem to change much whether we do or don't. Uh, so if we, we set D greater than zero, PSLQ root D takes an input in the reals, gives us an output in the integers of Q adjoin root D. Uh, when D is less than zero, we take complex input and output in the appropriate integers. So, what do the integers of Q adjoin D look like? Well, it turns out they can all be written in the form of Z adjoin omega, which is just you know, A plus B omega where these written Z. But the omega depends on the congruence class of, uh, root of D. So if D is 2 or 3 mod 4, then we just have essentially Z adjoin root D. Uh, but if D is congruent to 1 mod 4, then we actually have 1 plus root D on 2 as our omega. The end result of this being, in the case that D is congruent to 1 mod 4, we have either um, integers for A and B or half integers for A and B, but they have to both be the same. Uh, and a good way to see this is to think of um, 1 plus root 5 on 2 as being the, being the root of the monic polynomial, polynomial x squared minus x minus 1, x squared plus x plus Plus x plus x minus one. Ah. Okay, so to extend the algorithm, we need to note that the integers in the standard algorithm were all brought in through the Hermite reduction, and they were brought in through the Hermite reduction in turn through the nearest integer function. Uh, the good news is the construction of the reducing matrix um, through that argument I explained, the uh, uh, matrix argument, the elementary matrix argument, we can guarantee that the Hermite reduction will still be guaranteed to be in GLN of our appropriate integer field, because we had you know, invertible elements down the diagonal and it's lower trapezoidal. So that's good, that just works for free out of the box. We do run into a problem at this point. 
when we have d greater than zero, our algebraic integers turn out to be dense in the reals. When they're dense in the reals, we don't have a unique nearest integer, and that makes writing our nearest integer function problematic. Um, I did some experimentation with just picking one and seeing what happened, but it didn't work out very well. Uh, since then, I've actually realized a few things about the algorithm. I want to go back and look at it again later, but early experimentation wasn't good. Um, so that's our problem. So therefore, okay, put that in the think about later pile, consider complex cases, d less than zero. I should point out though that even in the complex case, as soon as we move to two adjoints instead of one, we have exactly the same density problem and oh, it's a problem that's something to be looked at later. So that's okay, we've just restricted ourselves to negative d. So there's two cases to consider. <coughs> this being that d is two and three mod four, in which case these are our algebraic integers and d equals 1 mod 4, in which case these are our algebraic integers. This is just the expansion of the omega notation I had in the other slide. Uh, in both cases, we've got a nice lattice where we've got a well-defined nearest integer function. So the lattice for the two or three cases is basically just a square like this, and the lattice for our, uh, our, half or our case for the half integers looks like this one. But the point is, it's a lattice. We can talk about nearest integer without any... It you know, doesn't matter if there's a couple to pick from. We've got a nicely defined one. Okay, so if I think about my input z as being a real plus an imaginary part and I want it to be approximately equal to a plus b omega, so I'm back to the omega notation now. Uh, just consider the real and imaginary cases separately. You get a set of simultaneous equations and solving them gets us this mess for our nearest integer function. It's pretty straightforward for the, uh, for the mod 2 and 3 case, but, uh, for the 2 or 3 mod 4 case, but this one's a fraction messier. Um, <coughs> okay. Okay, yeah. It's not that hard to write it down and sort, of sort it all out. And I'm just, because I don't want to confuse mints, I'm using the square bracket notation for the regular real to integer, nearest integer function here. So that's our nearest integer function, that's cool. Furthermore, so by square bracket you mean nearest integer? I mean, yeah, sort of nearest real, uh, nearest integer from a real number. Yes. Sure. It's just, I didn't want to use mint twice. Uh, so from the pictures I provided earlier, it's actually reasonably easy to bound the, um, bound the distance between a complex number and its nearest integer according to this new nearest integer formulation. They work out to be this. I should point out this bottom one I've just realized isn't a sharp bound. I computed it rather poorly. I've definitely computed a bound, but I've computed a bound that's larger than it needs to be, so I'm going to go back and revise that at some stage. But I've got those, so it's a simple matter to invert them to get the appropriate row for the algebraic extension field case. And we run into another problem again. If we have a look at these formulas here, as d increases, these are eventually going to go less than zero, uh, less than one. Now, our, our, case, uh, our criterion for tau is that tau is somewhere between one and rho. So if rho is less than one, we don't have an appropriate tau. <coughs> So uh, crunching the numbers, it turns out that um, the, existing, the existing theory holds for d equals minus 2 and d equals minus 3. And maybe d equals minus 7, but if we go to d equals minus 7, we've got this same row equals 1 and gamma equals infinity case, which is a bit iffy. So mm, we're down to these. So I've gone from simple algebraic integers to q adjoint root 2 and q adjoint root 3. This, this isn't necessarily minus. Uh, minus. Mm, minus, minus, yes, you're correct. Root minus 2 and root minus 3. So we're down to there. But the good news is that these two cases fit, or just fit for free straight into the existing theory. So, this is an experimental maths conference last I checked. I should do some, experiment, should have some experimentation and I'm running up on time so I'm going to have to breeze through this. I randomly, randomly generated a whole bunch of cases. I, just, I randomly generated the, the affix. I randomly generated how many constants we were going to have. I randomly generated the uh, algebraic integers for the constants, I calculated an integer combination and I spat uh, an integer ruler. Um, go on blank, one of these things. Linear relation, put it all together and basically said to the PSLQ, can you give me back what I made it? Uh, I ran test instances in groups of a thousand um, and essentially I wanted to see if PSLQ could either find it or we actually found in a number of cases, PSLQ was finding an algebraic integer multiple of <coughs> what I put in, which isn't actually surprising, so I counted for that as well. Uh, 
I've used a whole bunch of cases, different thresholds for determining zero, whether, it, whether a number is less than 10 to the 0.24 d, where d is the precision to which I calculated the, uh, the numbers, or 0.8 d, and these gammas for varying reasons. And that was the, these were the constants I picked from. The astute amongst you may actually notice there's a problem in that set. But I'm not going to say what that is yet. Okay, so if I just start with the case that already works, Gaussian integers, regular PSL can, can do this. Uh, so as long as I actually have this, the threshold correct, so I should point out this threshold here was chosen uh, earlier on in the project by Paul because he was trying to be conservative about avoiding numerical errors, so we had a very low threshold of zero. Uh, if the threshold's set high enough and we're actually using the correct gamma parameters, we fail on only three in two cases. Now, this is actually where the mistake I, in the last slide I mentioned comes in. If you go back here, you'll notice I've actually got log 3, log 2, and log 6 in the same set. There's an obvious linear, uh, there's an obvious integer relation between those three elements, and the, these two cases, these cases, this, certainly these two cases here that fail, don't actually fail, they've just found that obvious relation. So I can actually say that with, uh, in, in this case, I've had absolutely no fails, and we, we compared this against Maple, who, Maple's implementation, which pretty much had exactly the same results. Uh, Maple won't let you set any of these parameters, it just sets them itself. Okay, um, so I actually did this second. These were the ones I did first. Uh, not working, these ones down the bottom. Um, so this was Q adjoined root minus three and Q adjoined root minus seven, but only for half an inch of constants, because I was trying to test to see if our, uh, if our addition of the, addition to the nearest integer function for the half integer cases was actually working. And oh, I should note here, I'm counting fails. So in this case, with the right threshold and the right gamma, I'm getting uh, seven or five fails out of a thousand. And I haven't actually had a look at these yet to see how many of those have the, um, the finding the, the trivial uh, case. So that was great. So I was sort of jumped from the bottom one up to the top, back to the bottom one as I was getting my head around how these parameters all work. That's reasonably, um, uh, heartening. So okay, moving up to the two cases we know fit into the existing theory, we get pretty much exactly the same sorts of results with a high enough gamma and a good threshold for zero, five, five or four fails out of a thousand. Uh, I'll also point out for some reason, I haven't quite got my head around yet, that threshold of 0.8d I came to through trial and error. If I set it too high, I actually start getting more fails again, which suggests to me there's a problem somewhere in the code, but I haven't quite found it yet. Nonetheless, I'm still very happy with four out of a thousand fails. So I thought, what the hell, let's just try the cases that don't fit into the existing theory, and we're still getting 10 and 9 fails out of 1,000. Uh, there's a possible explanation for that given in the Ferguson, Bailey, Nano paper, but just from an experimental point of view, I'm ecstatic with this. So, yep, got this about right. So bowed by, by that, I thought, right, you'll notice we have a, have a look at the constants for here. They're all real constants. I'm generating complex... Uh, Integers, but I'm just I'm throwing them in front of real constants. So let's actually try some complex constants. So I generated these constants, the um, mm. just reasonably equally distributed around the circle integer values for the uh, for the argument to try, uh, integer rational angles for the argument, uh, not rational. Rational yeah. model forms of pi. Yes. Um, so that's to try and make sure they don't have any relations between them, and I just randomly generated the constants because I wanted some variability. In principle, the integer relation algorithm should pick that up, but I wanted to see it, so I threw them in there. And the results aren't quite as good. So we're looking at, you know, by the time we've actually got the sensible row and threshold, we're still looking at you know, nearly a 50% nearly a fail rate. This isn't as nice. Now, this is cutting edge stuff. The computation for this finished yesterday. So I haven't had a chance to actually look at these to see what's going on. It occurs to me the sensible thing to have done would have actually to have started with um, Q adjoined root 1 and compared the results from our, our code to the results of regular maple to see how it performs on the same numbers and that's what we're doing next. So that's what I've got at the moment. There's still plenty to go. So what's coming up next? I want to go back and just, uh, well, I've already mentioned this, I want to check the, the complex examples against the regular P Maple's implementation of PSLQ, because that might tell me where I'm going wrong. Um, I want to go back to the positive D case and just basically try picking an <coughs> integer that's close and see if that actually gets me anywhere now that I've got a better feel for the parameters and the thresholds. 
Uh, maybe we'll get Minkowski geometry, maybe we'll get cubic extensions. Um, probably cubic extensions involving some primitive roots of unity, but I can't think of any reason why the cubic extensions wouldn't give me the same um, density problem as the positive Ds. Uh, maybe try to find some property of the nearest integers that we can, we can exploit so that we've actually got a more unique nearest integer in the case where we don't have a lattice. And dot, 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 question mark, I'm open to ideas. Okay. Mm -hmm.